Hello everyone, my name is Kyle Drake. I'm a third year graduate student from the Kanadi Lab at the University of Connecticut, and I'm excited to share with you all my manuscript titled Loss of U11 Small Nuclear RNA in the Developing Mouse Limb Results in Micromelia. Now, as you all know, eukaryotic genes possess exons and introns. And for proper gene expression, these introns must be removed and the exons must be ligated together in the process of splicing, which is executed by the spliceosome. Now, eukaryotic genes possess two types of introns. Major introns shown as green lines, which make up greater than 99.5% of all introns. And these are defined by specific nucleotide sequences at the five prime splice site, the branch point sequence, and the three prime splice site, as well as the presence of a polyperimidine tract upstream of this three prime splice site. Conversely, minor introns, which I'm showing you as blue lines, make up less than 0.5% of all introns and are defined by highly divergent yet highly conserved nucleotide sequences at the five prime splice site branch point sequence and three prime splice site. Now, because small nuclear RNAs of the spliceosome base pair to these nucleotide sequences for intron identification and removal, these different uh, nucleotides that define these sites necessitates that there exist two distinct spliceosomal machineries to remove each intron type. Whereas the major spliceosome splices major introns and it is composed of the SNRNAs U1, U2, U4, U6 and U5, the minor spliceosome recognizes and splices minor introns, and it is composed of sequentially divergent, but structurally analogous SNRNAs U11, U12, U4A TAC, U6A TAC, and shares the U5 SNRNA with the major spliceosome. Now, minor intron containing genes, <coughs> or MIGs, which I'll say for the rest of my talk, have complex co transcriptional splicing because they often have a single minor intron embedded in genes that exist or that contain mostly major introns. And so when RNA polymerase II transcribes this gene and the major intron becomes available, the major spliceosome will assemble and splice out this intron. And as transcription is continued, the major spliceosome will remove this next major intron. But when the minor intron is transcribed, the major spliceosome cannot recognize this intron type. It dissociates and the minor spliceosome must be recruited to recognize this minor intron. Now, as transcription continues, the minor spliceosome will remove this minor intron, but again, it cannot recognize this downstream major intron, so it dissociates, the major spliceosome assembles, and as transcription is finished, the major spliceosome uh, removes this last major intron, polymerase II and major spliceosome dissociate, and this RNA is capped and polydendylated for nuclear export. Now this demonstrates how coordinated, both in time and space, the co-transcriptional splicing of MIGs must be for proper uh, splicing. And what's curious is that this type of complexity is required for a few genes. So in human, there exists uh, 770 minor introns found in 714 MIGs, whereas in mouse, there are 722 minor introns found in 666 MIGs. And when we looked at the expression of these MIGs throughout uh, many different tissues, we found that they are rather ubiquitously expressed for both mouse and human. And this ubiquitous expression is reinforced by the idea that the functions of these MIGs are rather diverse, but essential cellular processes, such as transport, cell cycle, transcription, stress response, protein modification, et cetera. And so minor intron splicing, therefore, is required in all these different tissue types and is ubiquitous process. But what's curious is that in diseases caused by inhibition of the minor spliceosome, we see tissue specific phenotypes. So what I'm showing you here is the U4 ATAC SNRNA with red arrowheads showing mutations that have been identified and linked to disease. And the three disorders linked to U4 ATAC mutations are microcephalic, osteodysplastic, primordial dwarfism type one or MOPD1, Reifman syndrome and Lowry Wood syndrome. And these diseases are caused by hypomorphic U4 attack, which perturbs, but does not abolish minor spliceosome function. And in each of these, we see cardinal symptoms of microcephaly or reduction in brain size, um, primordial dwarfism or severe reduction in the long bone length, as well as micrognathia reduction in jaw size. But these symptoms and the severity of these disorders exists along a spectrum where MOPD1 is the most severe. And this can be observed in both the life expectancy 
where these individuals uh, have the shortest life expectancy, and also in the severity of the overlapping symptoms where MOPD1 patients have the most severe form of these phenotypes. In contrast, Reifman syndrome and Lowry-Wood syndrome have more mild manifestations of these uh, symptoms. Now, clinically, it is thought, though it hasn't been proven, that different hypomorphic effects of U4A tac snRNA are what cause differential minor spliceosome impairment, and that's what causes this gradation in symptomology, where the minor spliceosome is severely impaired in MOPD1 and moderately impaired in Reifman syndrome and mildly impaired in Lowry-Wood syndrome. Nonetheless, what stood out to us when we looked at these disorders was that although the limb size is severely reduced in these patients, you can see, especially in this Lowry-Wood syndrome individual, that the general limb pattern is maintained and the structural organization is intact. So this is what led to my thesis and general question for this manuscript, which is how does inhibition of the minor spliceosome result in micromelia? Now to answer this question, I used our RNU11 conditional knockout mouse, which through Cree-mediated recombination ablates the U11 small nuclear RNA specific to an essential for minor spliceosome function and therefore inhibits the minor spliceosome. And I drove U11 loss in the developing limbs through PRX1 Cree, whose expression is primarily restricted to the developing limb buds and has, as you can see through this lag Z, um, at embryonic day 9.5, robust activity throughout the whole forelimb bud at E9.5, which is when the forelimb emerges. Now at E10.5, PRX1 Cree activity comes on in the hind limb, which is one half day after a hind limb development has begun. And you can see it's more mosaic in its activity. And this is going to be important for data that I will present soon. Now, when I crossed our U11 flux flux mice to PRX1 Cree positive mice, we indeed observed we were able to ablate the U11 snRNA in the developing forelimb at E10.5 in this whole mounted situ of this mutant embryo compared to the wild type. Whereas in line with PRX1 Cree, we did not yet observe loss of U11 in the hind limb at E10.5. We then quantified the reduction in U11 levels through QRT-PCR, where we found that the mutant forelimb at E10.5 had significantly reduced the U11 expression, whereas it wasn't until E11.5 that the mutant hind limb showed reduced U11 levels significantly. And in turn, we found that um, the limb bud surface area was significantly smaller in the mutant forelimb at E11.5, and it wasn't until one day later at E12.5 that we saw a significant reduction in the size of the mutant hind limb. Now, when we let these pups go to birth, we saw that U11 loss in the developing forelimb led to a severely reduced forelimb size, and this forelimb lacked any overt structural organization, whereas the hind limb did seem formed, just smaller in size. And so we performed skeletal preparation where alcyon blue here stains cartilage and alizarin red stains bone to identify which skeletal elements were present in these limbs. And to our surprise, we found that the mutant forelimb maintained the stereotypical three element segmentation that defines tetrapod limbs, um, as it had a stylopod, a single zygopod bone, and a single digit. Now the hind limb, on the other hand, contained all structural elements, a femur, a tibia, a fibula, and a foot with five digits, and it was merely reduced in size compared to the wild type. And so this data uh, indicated to us that indeed, um, the minor spliceosome is required for proper limb size during development, but nonetheless, it didn't tell us how inhibition of the minor spliceosome led to reductions in limb size. So to understand this, we must understand what happens when we inhibit the minor spliceosome. And simply when we cause U11 loss, we're inhibiting the minor spliceosome, which one outcome that is predicted is minor intron retention. And the problem with minor intron retention is that this invariably leads to the introduction of a premature stop codon, which then triggers either mRNA degradation or leads to the production of an aberrant protein. And nonetheless, you are losing what should be encoded by this MIG transcript. So we wanted to determine if there was elevated minor intron retention in the mutant limbs. So we performed RNA-seq on E10.5 and E11.5, wild type and mutant forelimb and hindlimb. And to quantify minor intron retention, what we do is we quantify the number of reads that map to the five prime splice site or the three prime splice site and normalize to the number of splice junction reads at this area. 
and determine what's called a misplicing index, which is the sum of these reads mapping to the minor intron divided by those reads plus uh, the reads coming from the spliced junction. And when we do this analysis, we can first determine whether general minor intron retention is overall elevated in the mutant limbs. So what I'm showing you is a box plot of the 10th to 90th percentile misplicing index, MSI, for all minor intron containing genes that show minor intron retention in our RNA-seq data. And indeed, we found that the median MSI in the mutant forelimb at E10.5 was significantly elevated, and that this was exacerbated by E11.5. But we did not find significant minor intron retention in the mutant hind limb at either time points analyzed. Now, in addition to overall intron retention, we can identify which MIGs in particular have individually elevated MSI. And when we did this, we found that there were 134 MIGs in the E11.5 mutant forelimb that had significantly increased retention, of which 118 were predicted to undergo mRNA degradation through the nonsense mediated decay or NMD pathway. And when I identified the gene ontology terms that these genes enriched for, we found cell cycle, cell division, mitotic nuclear division, and condensed chromosome kinetochore, indicating that cell cycle defects were perhaps um, awry in these limb progenitor cells. To determine whether cell cycle defects were occurring, we first performed immunofluorescence for FOSH3, which marks all mitotic cells. And indeed, we found an increase in the number of mitotic cells in the E11.5 mutant forelimb and the E12.5 mutant hindlimb. Now, one way you can get an increase in mitotic cells is due to cells being stuck in mitosis. And so we performed IF for Aurora B, whose subcellular localization can be used to identify each stage in mitosis. And indeed, we found a significant increase in the number of uh, progenitor cells in the mutant at E10.5 in the forelimb and in E11.5 in the hindlimb in pro-metaphase and a significant decrease in cells in the stages that follow, indicating that there was defective progression through metaphase. Now, in addition, we used an EDU-BRDU pulse chase paradigm that's been used both in the developing brain and the developing limb and found that S phase length was significantly reduced and overall cell cycle speed was significantly slower in E10.5 mutant progenitor cells in the forelimb and E11.5 in the hindlimb. And so both cell cycle speed was reduced and defective mitosis occurred 24 hours before we observed this significant increase in FOSH3 positive cells. And we hypothesized that these cell cycle defects would be detrimental to these rapidly dividing limb progenitor cells. And so to test whether cells were dying upon U11 loss, we performed fluorescence and CTU hybridization for U11, shown in green, followed by tunnel, which marks all apoptotic cells, shown in white. And when I did this analysis, I found that varying sections along the dorsoventral axis of the limb had differential tunnel staining patterns. So I processed all sections and overlaid them to render a three-dimensional heat map of cell death and identify the region where cell death was concentrated the highest. When I did this, I found that cell death was concentrated in the mutant forelimb at E11.5 in this distal posterior domain, whereas the mutant hindlimb contains cell death enriched in this distal anterior region. And in both, we see a distal bias. And so again, I want to reinforce that in MOPD1, Reifman syndrome, and Lowry Wood syndrome, we see a tissue specific phenotype upon minor spliceome inhibition where the brain and the limb are most affected. And now in this analysis, we're begin beginning to see further progenitor cell heterogeneity, where even within the same developing tissue, the distal limb progenitor cells are more susceptible to the consequences of U11 loss than the proximal ones. So what I've shown you is that in both the mutant forelimb and hindlimb, 24 hours after CRE is active, we see U11 loss, minor intron retention, mitotic defects, and slowing of cell cycle. And 48 hours after CRE is active, we see reduced limb surface area and distal cell death. And now because of the temporal delay in CRE activity in the hindlimb, we think that is what is causing the hindlimb to be more moderately affected, whereas the forelimb is severely affected at birth. But this is still speculative and leads me to my two major questions that remain um, for my thesis. And that is, why are distal limb progenitor cells more susceptible to the consequences of U11 loss than proximal limb progenitor cells? And is the difference in phenotype severity at P0 due to a forelimb-hindlimb heterogeneity or the time at which U11 is lost? 
Now, what I've shown you is just the surface of the role of the minor spliceosome in tissue size regulation. We've previously published a hypothesis and theory paper in Frontiers last year that looks at the evolutionary origin and conservation of minor introns, as well as their prospective role in regulating multicellular tissue development. And we even show a link between minor intron splicing um, and selection for MIGs in the evolutionary process of domestication syndrome. And similarly, we've also published in development um, the role of the minor spliceosome in cortical development as patients with MOPD1, Reifman syndrome, and Mallory Wood syndrome um, have microcephaly as their other major cardinal phenotype. And in this publication, we also show other progenitor cell heterogeneity in the developing cortex that reinforces some of the findings we see in the limb. So I encourage you to check out both of these publications if you're interested in minor splicing and tissue size. Lastly, I want to acknowledge everybody from the Canadia Lab, the Yukon PNB Department and Core Facilities, funding from both NIH and NSFG RFP. And I encourage you to check out our minor intron database at mydb, mydb.pnb.yukon.edu to see if a gene you're studying or one of your favorite genes has a minor intron and therefore has a regulatory feature that might be influencing its expression both in disease and development. And as always, you can contact us at the emails shown below. Thank you very much for your time. That was a great talk. I have a question that's not really related to your research, but that just uh, listening because I don't frequently think about splicing. Um, it's just really a general developmental biology question, but are, are enhancer elements more or less likely to be found in minor versus major introns? Is there anything um, about that that's known? Yeah, so I mean, I hate to say that uh, it actually has never been surveyed. So. <laughs> Uh, the minor splicing field is small. We um, are one of the few labs that are still characterizing and updating uh, annotations of genomes of various species to even identify minor introns. And so it's yet to be analyzed where enhancers lie within um, major intron containing genes versus minor intron containing genes or major and minor introns respectively. Um, but what I will share, which as a limb uh, biologists that I've always found interesting, though I don't know the relevance, is that the ZPA regulatory sequence enhancer, crucial for driving sonic hedgehog expression, is located in a minor intron containing gene. And now the probability of that, I, I don't necessarily know, but uh, I've always found that interesting. But um, I would be excited to look at like the ENCODE project, uh, you know, mm -hmm. all the enhancers that they have predicted and, and really see the distribution between major and minor introns to see if there's relevance there to development. Cool, thanks. All right, the next question then comes from Ryan Gray. Can you assess any defects of splicing of regulators known to be involved in the cartilaginous limb elements? So for example, did you look uh, and find, you know, significantly more splicing defects in things like SOX9 or PRMT5, the sort of developmental biology genes we usually associate with the limb? Yeah. In the, um, in, in our mouse model, if we see defects in the processing of those transcripts emanating from those two genes or if those splicing right. defects, yeah. So um, no, SOX9, PRMT5 don't change. And what's actually interesting is that chondrogenesis proceeds normally in the mutant limbs. And even the uh, mutant forelimb, which is severely disrupted, still you can, um, you can see chondrogenic uh, condensations occurring at embryonic day 12.5 in line with the wild type limb. And so the chondrogenic pathway doesn't seem to be disrupted. It really seems to be this progenitor cell proliferation and the creation of the appropriate number of cells to really structure a fully sized limb. Cool, all right, and just one last question before we break out uh, into the discussions. Um, there's a question about, uh, have you looked at the FGF8, FGF10 feedback loop and is this disrupted in your mutants? Yeah, so this is actually a really interesting thing that I'm currently working on. And when we do, so we did bulk RNA seq and we find these really fascinating a really overwhelming <clears throat> transcriptomic upregulation at E11.5 in the mutant forelimb. And this transcriptomic upregulation is actually seems to be a developmental delay of the limb patterning network. And that includes both FGF8 and Sonic Hedgehog, which are upregulated at E11.5, even when you normalize for a reduction in limb bud size. And so what we're beginning to do now is start to look at domain specific transcriptomic effects to make sure that, you know, we're not seeing any um, changes that are being influenced by changes in other regions of the limb, because we know the limb as a three-dimensional structure contains really specific uh, signaling gradients and, and morphogen gradients. And so FGF8 and Sonic Hedgehog are indeed upregulated at E11.5, and, and we hope to find more information about whether that's a primary or secondary consequence when we start to do our regional transcriptomic analysis.